Biblical interpretation involves at least two things. Uh, biblical interpretation first involves a Bible, and second, a reader. Without a reader, the Bible cannot do anything. It is in the dynamic relationship between the Bible and a reader that interpretation happens. Interpretation, then, involves as much human energy as divine inspiration. What people already believe about the Bible has a lot to do with how they interpret it. This is their doctrine of Scripture. Uh, so this doctrine of Scripture, or what someone believes about the Bible, affects the way he or she read the Bible. For example, if someone believes that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, then they will try to find something in the text that is a directive from God. They'll ask a question, what is God sp saying to me right now? Or what is God saying through the Scriptures? Now, if someone approaches the Bible without this doctrine of Scripture and asks different questions, then he or she will find different answers. Now, rather than being, uh, rather than the Bible being a book of answers, it's probably more accurate to say that uh, it's a library of questions. In other words, it was written by various authors over a period of approximately 1,600 years. It represents a library of books written at different times to address different circumstances and reflects the questions of the writers and communities to whom they were written. This is how we'll approach the Gospel of Matthew in this class. We will ask mostly historical questions, but also ethical questions, which will affect our interpretive process. We will not be concerned with what God may or may not be saying to us through the Bible for this class. We want to know what the Gospel of Matthew said to its original readers in their historical context. Historical questions are limited to natural history, which cannot account for the divine or supernatural. We will also ask ethical questions that will help us understand the Gospel of Matthew in modern light. Now that we have an idea of what we'll be doing in this class, let's turn to the Gospel of Matthew. So here's an introduction to the Gospel of Matthew. And here's some historical questions that uh, we'll ask to get a better understanding about the Gospel of Matthew. Who wrote it? Where was it written? Why was it written? When was it written? How was it written? Etc. Each of these questions could take as, as long as a class period to answer, uh, and we just don't have that time. So I'll give you a quick overview of each, uh, but we'll spend the remainder of our time working through uh, these questions. So let's uh, pursue each one of these questions uh, by themselves. Uh, who wrote the Gospel of Matthew? Uh, now, this may seem like an obvious answer, but it's not. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of John, all of those titles for each of the four Gospels in the New Testament were added centuries later, uh, and they were based on Christian uh, and church tradition. Uh, so uh, the problem is none of the four Gospels of the New Testament have an authorial autograph. And what I mean by that is none of the four Gospels have, I, Matthew, wrote this Gospel. Uh, the closest thing we get to is there in the Gospel of Luke, uh, in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That author also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. At the beginning of the Acts, you have something similar where he talks about um, um, how he's writing a gospel, to whom he's writing a gospel, but he never says, I, Luke, wrote this. Uh, so uh, all the titles, the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, were added later, which causes us some serious problems when we're trying to pinpoint who exactly uh, wrote this gospel. So who is Matthew anyway? Early church writers, uh, and when I say early church, I mean second century, uh, early second century. Most of these uh, early church writers uh, claim that the author of the Gospel of Matthew uh, was Matthew, a tax collector who became a disciple of Jesus. Uh, 
Uh, if you want to look that up in the Gospel of Matthew, it's in chapter 10, verse 3, and chapter 9, verse 9, in a list of the disciples of Jesus. Now, um, it's kind of weird uh, and archaic why they use these passages to determine that Matthew was the writer of this uh, Gospel. Uh, but there, uh, there's some change of names where Matthew uses Levi instead of Matthew uh, to be modest, and that's where these early church writers uh, came up with the tax collector Matthew as the writer of this gospel. Uh, it's very unclear uh, whether that's the case or not, and we really rely on church tradition uh, to, to come to terms with uh, Matthew. Uh, so since the author uh, knew about the destruction of the temple, whoever that author was, uh, we know that the destruction of the temple happened in the 70 of the Common Era. Uh, we, we know that he had to be alive at least after 70. Uh, and it's unlikely that many of Jesus' disciples lived this long. Jesus was probably crucified uh, around 29 or 30, uh, and 40 years later, um, most of those uh, earliest disciples would have already passed away. Uh, in, in particular, Peter and Paul, uh, Paul not being one of the original disciples, but an uh, early convert, they were both uh, uh, killed, according to church tradition, during Nero's reign as the emperor of the Roman Empire, uh, which means they would have died um, as late as 66 of the Common Era. So uh, they didn't even live uh, long enough to see the temple uh, being destroyed by Rome. Um, but we think that most of Jesus' earliest disciples uh, who followed him while he was alive uh, uh, were already dead by the destruction of the temple. Uh, so whoever wrote the Gospel of Matthew uh, probably wrote it after uh, 70. Uh, and we don't know who actually wrote it. So... Uh, but, but for the purposes of this class, we'll continue to use Matthew to follow church tradition. I also give us an idea of um, what uh, what book, uh, what gospel we're using over against the other one. So we don't want to be confused between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <coughs> so uh, this leads us to where it was written. Uh, it also doesn't say that in the Gospel of Matthew, so scholars have to read through the Gospel of Matthew to get a better understanding of you know, where it came from uh, and use clues within the text to do that. Uh, due to the strong knowledge of Jewish thought and belief in the Gospel of Matthew, it's likely that Matthew was written in Palestine or close by. Uh, so if it wasn't written in Palestine... Uh, it was certainly written within the provinces uh, that immediately surrounded. Uh, out of the two options, most scholars believe that it was either written in the region of Galilee uh, or in the city of Antioch, which was the capital of the province of Syria. And it was only a couple of hundred miles from Galilee. Uh, so Galilee or Antioch of Syria are the two main um, places where scholars think it was written. And due to the content within the Gospel of Matthew <clears throat> and its strong stance for Jewish law and the reluctant inclusion of Gentiles into the Jesus, Jewish covenant uh, with God through Jesus as Messiah, most scholars believe that Antioch of Syria is probably the place of origin. And we're going to talk a lot about this throughout the gospel, uh, throughout this course. So don't worry about trying to get all this information right now. It's just important to give you an idea about where this gospel was written. Uh, now we think it's Antioch primarily because of Paul's letter to the Galatians. There in chapter 2, uh, he outlines a confrontation that he had with Peter and these people uh, he called men from James. And James was the leader of the Jesus movement, and he was headquartered in Jerusalem. Uh, and so James apparently sent men from Jerusalem to Antioch, where Peter and Paul were living. And Peter and Paul were eating with Gentiles uh, without any kind of separation. And Paul thought this was fine. But when the men from James came, Peter withdrew fellowship. Uh, and that's the nature of that conflict that happened in 
Antioch, according to Paul's letter to the Galatians. And so the nature of that conflict uh, has to do specifically with the inclusion of the Gentiles. And that occupies a primary space uh, in the Gospel of Matthew. So we think that it was probably written in Antioch. And this kind of helps answer, you know, why it was written. As you can see from the last question, question where it was written, there are two primary issues that the Gospel of Matthew attempts to address. One, how does the Jesus movement relate to the Jewish scriptures, i.e. the Torah? Uh, in other words, the Jesus movement, Jesus was Jewish. Uh, the earliest leaders of the Jesus movement after Jesus' death were Jewish. Paul was Jewish. Uh, but how did the Jesus movement relate to Jewish scriptures? This is a primary issue throughout the Gospel of Matthew. The other main issue is how does the Jesus movement relate to Gentiles? In other words, what are their requirements to join the movement? According to Jewish scripture, if a Gentile converted from paganism to Judaism, uh, and claimed uh, the one God of Israel as their God. There were certain requirements that Gentiles had to do, and one was circumcision. It was a primary mark of the covenant, uh, and so for Gentiles to become part of the Jewish any uh, part of Judaism, they had to be circumcised. This became a heated debate in early Christianity, particularly with the Apostle Paul, who did not believe the Gentiles had to be circumcised because he felt like all they had to do is um, have the same faith as Jesus. Well, the Gospel of Matthew and some other New Testament writings uh, seemed to really push against this, uh, but the entire Gospel of Matthew tries to answer these questions while existing entirely under Roman imperial oppression. So the Gospel of Matthew does several things. Uh, it was written under Roman oppression, so you'll hear echoes uh, and nuances that uh, combat Roman imperialism. But the whole time the Gospel of Matthew is doing that, the Gospel of Matthew is trying to uh, determine how the Jesus movement relates to Jewish scriptures and Jewish tradition, and tries to determine how Gentiles are incorporated into this Jewish movement. So, when was it written? Uh, because it's clear that the author of Matthew knew that the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Romans, um, which happened in the 70th the Common Era, the composition of the gospel uh, has to be after this date. So it has to be after 70 of the Common Era. Uh, and then the relatively early nature of the arguments regarding Gentile inclusion and uh, Jewish scripture seems to indicate a relatively early dating. So we know it has to come after 70, but it can't come much after 70. Uh, so most likely it was written a decade or two after the destruction of the temple, which puts the gospel around uh, 80 or 90 of the common era. So right at the end of the first century is most likely when the gospel of Matthew was written. So let's move on now to a really interesting question. Uh, how was the Gospel of Matthew written? Now, I must say before we kind of get into this uh, issue, that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all called the synoptic Gospels. And they're called synoptics because of the synopsis. Uh, you can lay Matthew, Mark, and Luke beside each other, and there's, uh, they agree with each other chronologically. Uh, so they're very, very close to each other from a literary standpoint. And so scholars try to understand uh, exactly how they relate to each other literarily because there's large sections uh, of all three of these Gospels that are verbatim. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke all agree on some in areas. Uh, and then there are places where Matthew and Luke agree with each other, but it's that area is totally absent in the Gospel of Mark. So uh, trying to figure out how these three Gospels relate to each other is called the synoptic problem. And what I'm about to do is kind of give you uh, modern scholarly consensus about how to answer the synoptic problem, how Matthew, Mark, and Luke relate to each other literarily. Uh, 
So uh, due to large sections of the Gospel of Matthew being nearly verbatim with the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Luke, we believe that Matthew had a copy of the Gospel of Mark, and he used that as a source when writing his Gospel. So Matthew follows the chronology of the entire Gospel of Mark. So if you look at the Gospel of Mark and read it from beginning to end, both Matthew <coughs> excuse me, and Luke follow that series of events. Uh, they don't stray from the chronology of Jesus' ministry and life from Mark. Now, both Matthew and Luke add stories to the Gospel of Mark uh, because the Gospel of Mark is mostly a series of miracles um, that narrate Jesus' life. Jesus does not have prolonged teachings in the Gospel of Mark. All the teachings are very short. They are not sermon length. Uh, so Mark provides a series of miracle stories, basically, for, the, for Jesus. Uh, Gospel Mark has no birth narrative uh, at all, and so he doesn't narrate Jesus' birth. It begins with Jesus' baptism, and the resurrection story in Mark is also very muted. Uh, the original ending at chapter, uh, ends at chapter 16, verse 8, uh, and that 9 through 20 was added later, uh, because it's such a small resurrection story uh, with no uh, eyewitnesses to the resurrection in the original ending. So Matthew has a copy of the Gospel of Mark in front of him when he's writing his Gospel, and he embellishes or fills out the stories in the Gospel of Mark. Mark is much shorter than both Matthew and Luke, and so Matthew, it looks like Matthew expands those stories of Mark. Matthew also adds large sections of teaching to Jesus' ministry that's completely lacking in the Gospel of Mark. So, uh, for instance, uh, Matthew uses uh, the first sermon of Jesus in Matthew is chapter 5, 6, and 7. So you have three chapters that compile a sermon we call the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. That's totally uh, absent in Mark. And we don't believe that Mark would use Matthew and then cut out large sections of teachings that were Jesus' teachings. We believe most likely that Matthew had a Gospel of Mark in front of him, used it, and added these teachings of Jesus. So Matthew has five large sections of Jesus' uh, sermons. So uh, these five sermons in Matthew really kind of divide Matthew uh, up as a Gospel. Uh, but they're all lacking in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, so that's how Matthew relates to Mark. He uses Mark as a source. <coughs> Excuse me. But Matthew and Luke, they also have large sections that are completely different from each other. So the birth narrative in uh, Matthew chapter 1 and 2 is completely different than the birth narrative in the uh, Gospel of Luke chapter 1 and 2. So they have large sections that are completely different, and then they have large sections that are very close, sometimes verbatim. Uh, and these sections are not in the Gospel of Mark. So we think that both Matthew and Luke, when they wrote their Gospels, they had a copy of the Gospel of Mark in front of them, both of them. And they also had another source, another common source that they used. But we don't think that Matthew knew Luke or Luke knew Matthew. We think Matthew wrote his gospel independent of Luke, and Luke wrote his gospel independent of Matthew. But where Matthew and Luke agree with each other, and it's not in Mark, we think they use this similar source, and scholars call that source the Q source. Now, the word, the, the term Q Q source comes from the German word Kella, and that Kella simply means source, so it's kind of funny. It's source, source, or Q source. Um, and that's where Matthew and Luke agree with each other, almost verbatim, uh, and it's not in Mark at all. Uh, so we think that Matthew uses, just like Luke uses, a copy of Mark and a copy of Q source to write their Gospels. Uh, and so Matthew takes a copy of Mark and a copy of Q, and then he adds additional stories to these sources and reworks some of this material to produce his gospel. 
Uh, so, like I said earlier, how Matthew, Mark, and Luke relate to each other literarily, that's called the synoptic problem, and I've just answered a lot of that for you. So, we believe that Mark was written first chronologically. We believe that Matthew and Luke used the Gospel of Mark when they wrote their Gospels. They also had another source called the Q source that they used. They wrote their Gospels independently of each other, uh, and that's how Matthew, Mark, and Luke relate. So I hope this gives you a, an overview of the Gospel of Matthew. I hope it also gives you an idea, a, a quick idea about the process of biblical interpretation and what goes in it and how we're going to interpret Matthew for this class. And I hope it, at the very beginning you got an understanding of what this class is going to mean, uh, what's going to be required of you. Uh, for this class. So any kind of questions that you have, uh, just let me know. Send me an email and I'll uh, be uh, as quick as I can in responding to you. Take care.